Welcome to North Gainesville Baptist Church, the Troy. Let's take our song books and turn to page 174. Page 174, we'll stand and sing Faith is the Victory, the first, second, and last verse. Page 174. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers run. Press the battle word is like the veil of glowing skies against the foreign bells below let all our strength run hurl. Overcomes the world. Thank you for coming this evening. By coming, you increase your faith because you've come to hear the word of God. Amen. That's very important. Brother Troy Blakely, would you pray for us this evening? Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Just a couple of announcements tonight. Don't forget, uh, on this coming Wednesday night, we're going to have a guest uh, speaker, Brother Vladimir and Maya Kruchin. They are missionaries to Ukraine. They'll be sharing their testimony and how God has called them to the, to the ministry, to the mission field of Ukraine. Uh, so looking forward to hearing from them. Also, uh, Bible study coming up. Men's Bible study on uh, that Thursday at 730. I believe it's our eighth installment of our Bible study. So looking forward to that. Phoebe Fellowship, ladies, hope you've signed up for that. Uh, sign ups on the back. Uh, please give your money if you haven't already to Miss Dorothy there in the back. Uh, but Janet Callen will be our speaker. I know you ladies will be looking forward to that. And of course, Mother's Day is next Sunday for all you uh, kids and fathers, husbands. Just a reminder, don't forget. Don't wake up Monday. Monday going to be cold if you if you forget. <laughs> Monday be real cold. 
Uh, but Memorial Day coming up, we're going to do something very special, as I mentioned, for Brother Vern uh, Hodgkins. But Pete's going to do that communion service that night, churchwide visitation on June 1st, and a homecoming June 12th and 13th. We had a great business meeting this last Wednesday night, uh, and I appreciate Brother Pete and all the work that he's done. And uh, I thank you folks for voting, uh, allowing me to go to uh, Israel for 10 days by the, by, by the grace of God coming up and, um, in October. And uh, thank you for that. Look forward to that. I know I'll be a blessing and I'll be able to share some of that with you. If you have any questions about that, any questions, ask me. Ask me. Brother Pete? So we, we voted on that on Wednesday. Uh, and I came in this morning and just checking the mail and we got in a check for $5,000. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and it just made me just reflect that. You know, we when we take care of our pastor, provide education opportunities like this. The Lord's going to bless His church. Amen. Amen. So I just wanted to share that. Right? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, you can you can clap. You can clap. That's good. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's a good thing. Anything we do here, I hope you know. I know Brother Pete is with, with finances, and I'm with anything we do at the church. We have an open door policy. You have any questions about what we do, why we do it, man? Don't feel free to come and ask. Uh, man, and, and always go to the source. It's the biblical thing. We're going to talk about the Bible. The biblical thing is when you have a question about something that we're doing, go to the source. Amen. Pastor, why are we use the King James Bible? Come ask me. Uh, how much we why, how much are we spending on uh, taking care of the church, the inside of the church? Go to Brother Pete, but always go to the source. Don't go to someone else, but outside of the source, Amen. go to the source. That's what the Bible teaches, and we want to do things the Bible way. All right? So let me encourage you in those things, and I look forward to what God's going to do. Brother? Take a song books and turn to page 357. Almost like the Magnum. 357. We we'll stand and sing, Work for the Night is Coming. Page 357. We'll sing the first and last. <laughs>
Fellowship is over. Our fellowshipping is over. Let's take our song book and turn to page 13. Page 13. We'll sing. We'll just sing all this whole song. Page 13. That's true. I hope that's true with you. The longer you serve him, the sweeter he grows. Wonderful. Brother Ruel, would you pray for the offering this evening? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day that you gather us once again in your house. Please bless our pastor as he brings your sweet message for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray for all our brother and sister 
that are sick right now. Thank you, Lord, for healing them. Thank you for watching them, Lord. Please guide them. All these people that seek in the whole world, please watch us. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Miss Robin. Tonight, I, was, I mentioned we're going to start a series on why are we Baptists? I don't know if you ever heard of any messages on that or read any of that. You should know what you are. You should know why you're a Christian. You should know why you're Baptist. Because somebody, somebody's going to ask you, they're going to ask you why you believe what you believe. And if you don't know why you believe what you believe, then why are you doing what you're doing? I mean, if, if you're going down the road, you're going down, you're going down 39th Avenue and you don't know why you're going down 39th Avenue. You might want to stop somewhere, not in the middle of the street. Don't hit your brakes, ladies. I mean, men, I mean, again. don't stop in the middle of the street. So I don't know where I'm going. No, actually turn off, stop and think about. But you ever get yourself going in the house, you're going direction and you have to stop and think about why you're going in that room. A lot of times we do that in life. Well, that's that life. We ought to know why we believe what we believe, and especially we know what, why we believe that we're Baptists. If you have your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 1 this evening, 2 Peter chapter 1, and looking at verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1 and looking at verse 19. Why are we Baptists? 2 Peter chapter 1, looking at verse 19. I mentioned this verse this morning. We'll here look at it again. If we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in the dark place unto the day dawn and the day star rises, arise in your hearts. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Lord, I pray, God, that you just bless the night as we teach your word. Give us ears to hear. Give us ears of understanding. Help us to apply these, these truths, Lord, to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to gain this knowledge, Lord, so we may not only take it to ourselves, but share it with others. And, Lord, help us make it applicable to our, our own lives. And help us, Father, help us have a love, a hunger for your word. More than anything else in this world, may we have a hunger and desire for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we use an acrostic, the word Baptist, and we'll start off with the B, of course. Why, do we, why are we called Baptists? Number one, as I mentioned this morning, because we believe in the biblical authority. We believe in the biblical authority. We do, we're not up here today telling uh, cunningly devised fables that we talked about this morning. We're not up here uh, just to give a bunch of illustrations, though in, illustrations do open the window and shed light in different areas. We're not up here just to give uh, jokes and laughs and, and read poems, though those are part of preaching or teaching. But ultimately, the source of, and why we do what we do is because of the Word of God. The Bible is, is the source of our faith and practice. The Bible is the source of our faith and practice. We do what we do solely, hopefully, by the grace of God, based on what the Bible teaches. Now you say, well, man, there are some things we do. Obviously, there's things in the Bible uh, that, that things that are not in the Bible that we do, like Sunday night service. You'll never find a Bible where it says have a Sunday night service. But we believe the Bible teaches the importance of tradition. And as Baptists, we've had traditions of meeting three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night. There's a tradition of Sunday school. You'll never find Sunday school in the Scriptures. It's not there, but is the Sunday school bad? No, it's a good thing. It's a tradition. It's a good tradition. And so uh, there's some things that we, we, we look at in the scriptures and say, well, while we do, the, the principle and the idea is, is there in it. 
So we, but we want to look at why we believe we're Baptists and we believe we're Baptists and we teach the importance of being a Baptist because we believe in the biblical, we in biblical and authority. As we look at biblical authority, we look, of course, at the Bible itself, the Bible itself. Now, there is a difference as we look at the Bible itself between a version and a transla trans trans translation. What is a translation? A translation is copying the scriptures from one language into another. The Bible was not written in English. You folks know that, right? It was not written originally in English. It was written in Greek and Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic. That's, that's where it was written. But it was translated to Latin. And eventually, thank God for men like William Tyndale, who translated it to English. Now, if you read some of these men, and there I can give you lots of books, Fox's Book of Martyrs, which we have in our library now, will give you a history of how we got our English Bible and how they gave their very lives for having the book that you have in your laps this, this evening. They gave everything. Why? Because the Catholic Church didn't want the folks to have the Bible. They, they were living in the darkness. That's why they were called the Dark Ages. Because they lived in darkness. They didn't have the scriptures. And without the scriptures, there's no light. The Catholic Church had one Bible. It was in the Catholic Church. It was chained to the pulpit of the church. The only way you could go in there was to actually know Latin and be able to read it and go in and, and make time to go read it. But those men that you find in the Fox's Book of Martyr wanted the Bible in the, in the hands of every person in England. And so they, they gave their lives to do it. So it was a, they translated it from Latin to English. Now, a version is a copy of scriptures from, from within a language, copy of copy. A translation is taking the Hebrew, Greek, and translating it into a language. A version is the name placed on it by its translators, like we use the King James Version of the Bible. But mostly this process involves changing of a percentage of words for a price. Why do we have so many versions of the Bible today? I tell you the one reason, because of money. Money, the love of money, is the root of all evil. If you want to find the reason why 99% of the time why people do what they do, they'll give you a whole lot of excuses. Oh, we want to make the word of God clear. Well, that sounds good. But really, it goes back to money. See, the King James Bible, it has no copyright. <laughs> it has no copyright. So to copy it, which many of our first Bible international, other folks, very impressed to see, the folks we support, the cost is to cheap to copy the, the, the scriptures. Why? Because there's no copyright. And I praise God for that. So we want to know the difference between a version and, tra and translation. In order to get an accurate copy, you always have to keep and go back to the original, the original, the original. So the Bible is our, is our sole and only authority for faith and, prop, and practice. One of the few denominations, we are one of the few denominations, and we are fundamental independent Baptist church. We're not Southern Baptist church. We're an independent Baptist church, meaning we don't give 10% of our gross income to a, a group of people. The Southern Baptist Convention. Other churches down the road, Southern Baptist folks, they give 10% of their gross income to an organization, the, the convention and other things, uh, to, to use it as they, play, as they see fit. We don't. Everything that comes into this church stays here. Stays here. And so we're accountable to, for what we, the amount we spend, and we're accountable to God. So, again, it's very important that we have this wonderful book. Uh, without uh, some type of man-made book or guidebook or handbook, no problem can arise in respect to our faith and practice that the answer cannot be found in the Scripture. You're struggling in your marriage. Dear friends, don't go to, don't Google it. Go to the Word of God. <laughs> you struggle with finances. Well, what do you, well, go to the Word of God. You're struggling raising your children. Go to the Word of God. You're struggling with friendships. Go to the Word of God. You struck, folks. Don't go to don't go to don't go to all the sources of the world. Don't pick up a magazine in Publix and find your answers there. Find your answers here. 
Go to the Word of God. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? We're supposed to be people of the book. The word Bible comes from the Greek word bibulos, means sheet or scroll, having to do with the inner bark of the papyrus plant in which the many ancient writings were penned on. Another Greek word for bibula, which means the book. We add holy to it because we believe this book is holy and it's divine. Our Bible contains 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years. Forty authors were used. It's a divine book. It's a divine book. Our Old Testament, four main divisions, five in law, 12 in history, four in poetry, five minor prophets, 12 major prophets. New Testament, three divisions, history, doctrine, and prophecy. We use the majority text. There's two main manuscripts, the majority text, which are 5,500 manuscripts, which agree most of the time. And there's the minority text, which comes the NIV, ESV, ABC, EFG, all the other letters you can put in the alphabet because they're just about all out there. The minority text, all other versions use 50 manuscripts, and they vary the, from the, from one another, they use, of course, these two men, the Westcott and Hort text. The major contribution uh, was found. One of them, actually, one of the one of the contributions uh, of this text, the West Hort text, was actually found in a trash can in, in the in the Catholic Church. So um, that's why I use the majority text, and we use the King James Bible, from which the translators eventually used had the King James Bible. So four truths about the Word of God tonight. First of all, it's inspired Word of God. The word inspired comes from two Greek words, theos, meaning God, and theon, meaning to breathe, to combine theonostuos, or God breathe. We have a God breathe book. This is not a book of any man's private interpretation. This is God's book. It's God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. They, some people say, well, man, I, they, they pen good books or pen good words good works. And they think they say the word, well, it was inspired. But dear friends, there's nothing been inspired like this book. There's nothing been inspired like this book. Second Samuel chapter 23, verse one. Uh, now, these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said that the man who was raised up on high, anointed of God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, said the spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my was in my tongue. Luke chapter 1, verse 7, and he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Acts chapter 1, verse 16, men and brethren, scriptures must needs be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. Over and over and over and over through the scriptures, that God, through his spirit, used men of God to write this wonderful book. What is inspiration? Inspiration is not an emotional state of enlightenment. It's not an emotional state. I feel inspired to do a certain thing. That's not the same thing as the inspiration of the scriptures. In 1611, God once again inspired these men to give us the King, the King James Bible. Now, some people say that these men in 1611 were specially inspired. See, the reality is before the 1611, there were other Bibles too, right? Coverdale Bible, uh, other Bibles that were used greatly of God. The mistake that some people believe, teach, and I believe it's a heresy, is a person can only get saved by by using the King James Bible. You see, the problem, if that's true, then what would they do before the King James Bible? Did anybody get saved before the King James Bible in 1611? Well, see, the King James Bible, as much as I love it, is not all over the world, is it? It's, it, it's not in some place of the world. What if it's in a different language? What if you're in the Ukraine? Or what if you're in Venezuela? Or what if you're in Portugal? See, the, 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 the focus is the truth. What is the truth? People get saved from the truth. The truth of the scriptures. 
If you, if, if you get the fact that the truth that God loves you so much that God sent, that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, you can have everlasting life. You, you acknowledge that truth. You can be saved. You can be saved. Now, I'm not trying to diminish at all the importance of the King James Bible, but I believe it's a heresy to think a person can only be saved by using that one translation. It's very important that we make a difference in that. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit is a belief that God gave specific words, specific individuals to write and reproduce. Furthermore, I believe that these inspired words perfectly preserved for us in this King James Bible. That's why we use it. That's why we teach it, because we believe in that for English speaking Bible, God has preserved his word through this wonderful translation. That's why we teach it. That's why we preach it. That's why we memorize it. That's why we meditate upon it. That's why this is the only book we use in Sunday school class in all of our teaching and preaching. And so that's why this it's so important. Secondly, not only is it inspired, it is inerrant. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Very, very I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall pass, no wise from this law, till all be fulfilled. You say, preacher, is there any errors in the scriptures? Well, in the scriptures, there's no errors, but can there be errors of, of uh, punctuation or spelling? Do copyists ever make errors? Sure they do, because they're humans. There's no errors in the scripture, meaning there's no contradiction. Now, people will say to you, especially folks who are not saved, there's contradiction in scriptures. No, there's no contradiction in scriptures. There's contradiction of thought. We, we think there's contradiction. Oftentimes, people look at the book of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. They say, well, there's contradiction. Look what Matthew said. Look what John said. Well, dear friends, if something happened here today, and I asked you 10 minutes later to describe it, all of you would describe it a little bit differently, wouldn't you? Because you're different people. God, the Holy Spirit, spoke through people, but they weren't robots. They were human beings with a perception and a perspective. And God used that from different perspectives. That's why you'll see Luke and John and Matthew and Mark look from a, from a different perspective. So there are no errors in the scripture, though there may be copyright errors or may be spelling errors or maybe uh, punctuation errors. But the King James scholars, again, remember, were not God breathed or inspired. They were translators. They were great men. And I've talked about this. I did two sermons on why we believe the King James Bible. If you don't, if you didn't get that, I encourage you to get that. The Bible is to be interpreted. How is it supposed to be interpreted? It's supposed to be interpreted literally. Literally. Like you pick up a paper and you read it. How do you read it? Well, if you, if you read that Trevor Lawrence was the first person picked up in the glass, in the, in the draft by the Jacksonville Jaguars, that didn't mean, well, there was a Lawrence of Olivier somehow or another made it to the, to the place where the Jaguars eat food. No, actually, a quarterback from Clemson University was drafted by the Jacksonville Jaguars this last Thursday night. But people try to interpret the Bible some crazy way. Well, it says, it says that. Fear folks, take it for what it says. Take it for what it says. When it makes sense, seek no other sense. When it makes sense, seek no other sense. What does it say? We're to interpret it literally, not allegorically or spiritualizing it. A story told to help uh, get a deeper meaning. Yes, Christ uses parables, which is a, a earthly story with a heavenly meaning, but they were used, they were not tied to people's names. I believe in an actual flood, a flood that was a universal flood, not just some type of uh, puddle hopper. I mean, I mean, I believe in a universal flood that killed every living creature except for those eight people and animals in that ark. You say, preacher, every God, God destroyed the rest of the world. Yes, he did. Yeah, he did. He did. Why? Because people turned their back on God. Yeah, people turned their back on God. The world was filled with violence. You see, preacher, is the Bible, does the Bible say there's literally going to be a hell where people go? Yeah, there's literally going to be a hell where people go. 
That's why we go on visitation on Saturday. That's why we support 40 folks for missions, because we don't want people to go to hell. And by the way, God never sent anybody to hell. It's our sin that causes us to go to hell. It's not God. God has never, has never sent one person to hell. Our sin separates us from God. I believe that Jonah was actually swallowed by a fish. You say, he, he, you believe Jonah? Was, yeah, I believe it. Why? Because the Bible says so. I believe it. Now, you might not get the, you might not go to your state university and ask for the professors there what they think about it. They don't think, well, it's allegory and it has some type of deeper meaning. And, you know, it's the big struggle between good and evil. It's kind of like Star Wars, you know, good versus bad. <laughs> but dear folks, you got to know the source. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1, 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is any private interpretation. What does the Bible say? The best way to interpret scripture is with other scripture. That's the best way to interpret. What does the Bible say? What else does it say? That's why it's important not just to know what the Bible says in the New Testament, but know the Old Testament. Know what it all says, but collectively knowing the whole thing is going to help you interpret what the Scripture actually says. So it's inspired. It's inerrant. It's interceding. John chapter 14, 26, with the comfort of which the Holy Ghost, which the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever said unto you. It's indestructible. This book is indestructible. You think Hitler tried to destroy it? Yes, he did. You think the Antichrist is going to try to destroy it? Yes, he is. But it's indestructible. Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, is thy word settled in heaven. Psalm 20, 12, verse 6 and 7, thy words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle. That's the smallest markings in the scripture. Not one jot or one tittle shall, shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. I believe that not just the message of the word God is preserved, but the actual words of this book are preserved for us today to have. I encourage you. That's why I encourage you. To read it, meditate on it, study it, memorize it, focus on it. Because it is very important. The Bible doesn't just contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. You go to some commentaries, Broadman commentary, Southern Baptist, Old Southern Baptist commentary. They'll look at the first 12 verses, first 12 chapters, 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. And they will say, well, they're not accurate. They're not true. They're just stories. They're just myths. Dear friends, the first 11 chapters of the Bible is not true. The whole of the book's not true. It's either all true or not part true. There was one person, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, I believe it was, he would take a Bible and he would take a razor and he would just go through the scriptures and he would, what he believed was true, he would just cut it, cut it out. If he didn't believe it was true, he would cut it out. Places, things he thought it was God, he would keep it. That's how we live our lives sometimes. Oh, man, that's good there in, in Timothy. I think I believe that. But that there in, in 2 Peter, I won't believe that. Folks, it's all, it's all true, and it's for every one of us. It's all true, and it's in every, for every one of us. So we see the inspiration of the Bible, the inerrancy of the Bible, the interceding Word of God, the instructability of the Word of God. But secondly, the night, the inspiration and the canicity of the scriptures. I say, what in the world are you talking about when you're talking about canonicity? Canonicity comes from the Greek word canon, which go back to the Hebrew word quenon, which means a rule or standard. It involves a list or an index. The Council of Carthage completed in 397. The complete church was considered, the complete the Christian church considered the canon of the Bible to be complete. If it's going to be complete, then it must be closed. The canonicity means what, what books of the Bible are actually inspired by God and should be, it should be in the canon of scriptures. The canon of scriptures is a list of books which met the standard. There were five tests that involved determining the validity, the validity of a book. 
Number one, divine authorship. Is it inspired? Is it inspired? Does it appear to have, does it appear to come from, the, from God or just men or just, or, or just man alone? Was there a human authorship? Was it written, edited, or endorsed, endorsed by a prophet or a spokesman of God? Number three, genuineness. Is it genuine? Can it be traced back to the time and writer to whom it professes to have come? If the writer cannot be named positively, can it be shown to contain the same matter in every essential point as it contained when written? Forgery and Bible letters from prophets or divine authors have always existed. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be soon not shaken in mind or troubled by spirit, nor by word nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. There's, there's, there's all types of folks say, well, you, you need to add this book of the Bible, this book of the Bible. But did it meet these tests? Was it from a divine author, a human authorship, genuineness, authenticity? Is it authentic writing of a true and actual facts? Testimony. Do others corroborate from this author writing or top topic? Inadequate views of canonicity. Some believe, some believe the books and writings are to be included simply because of their antiquity. If it's old, it must be good. That sounds good, doesn't it? But it's not true. There's a lot of books out there that are old, but they're not biblical. They don't, meet the, they don't meet the test. They don't meet the test of a divine authorship or human authorship or genuineness. And all these five tests had to, had, had to be, are all incongruent with one another. They all had to be asked, are these things true? So when they had this council in 397, these believers came together and said, these books of the Bible meet the test of canonicity. We believe these scriptures to be true. So it's not just if it's old enough. It doesn't meet the test. They all include ancient Hebrew writings. Answers 15 books of antiquity referred to in the Bible itself, but none of them made the cut. In Joshua 1 and 10, verse 13, it says, The sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves from the enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? We say, well, book of Jasher, where's that at? It's not. But the Bible refers to other books. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 18, he also invaded and teach the children of Judah using the, the bow. Behold, it is not written in the book of Jasher. Now, some of, the, some of these books, some of these canon are merely a collection of, of choice writings, Hebrew writings. Some say it should only include Hebrew writings. Others view it as, as just the gist of them. But what about the Apocrypha, people ask? You ever ask that? What about the Apocrypha? No Apocrypha books ever made it into the Jewish canon of scriptures. Josephus, first century author, who's often quoted, used the Apocrypha. There's not one quotation in the New Testament from the Apocrypha. Jesus and disciples never referred to them. No church council during the first four centuries favored them. It wasn't until the 1600s that the Greek church accepted them at all. And the Catholic church never accepted until the 1500s. The early 1500s, Bibles included them, but in a different section, and noting they were, uh, they were not historically always historically correct and not, of course, canon of scriptures. They have, not been in the, they have been no early church commentaries discovered covering these books. So we don't believe the Apocrypha is canon of the scriptures. That's why we don't use them. New Testament. Some denominations question, is it, is it an inclusion of the New Testament canon? Eyewitness to Christ, the apostles, ministers were dying off, and the need for authoritative writings to exist. What was the reasons for the New Testament? The demands of the early church. Heresy becoming prevalent. Missionary endeavors, persecution, and politics. A guide was needed for both. There was a test for the authenticity of the New Testament. Apostolic, apostolic authenticity, either by apostle or by one of the, another authority who wrote it. When we read the churches that day, did the church accept them? Not just a few, but the churches as a whole accepted them, and they were read publicly. Were they read and accepted by first century church and first leaders? Yes. The content agreed with the doctrine of the apostles that had taught them orally. Did the books edify? Did they encourage a believer in matters of God? Were they merely historical in nature? And finally, the witness of the Holy Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit bear witness in their hearts that that was authentic from God and from the Holy Spirit? Now people say, now what about the these and thous? What about the these and thous? 
These and thou's were archaic words used even uh, in the 1611 translation, but they were left to show the grammatical differences between the, between the second person. The first person would use I and we. The second person, you. The third person, he, she, or it, and they. You see, folks, there's always been an attack on the Word of God, hasn't there? If, 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 if we're going to be attacked as, as Christians, it always goes back to the Word of God. It always goes back to the Word of God. Because you know what? We need the Word of God in our lives. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 19, verse 10, More to be desired than the gold, yea, the much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, than the honeycomb. Brother DJ and I, on Friday, went all the way to Plant City. Why? To get some strawberry shortcake. And then after the strawberry shortcake, he looked at me and said, Hey, you want some more? I looked at him and said, Are you hungry? And he said, Yeah, I, I could eat some more. He looked at me and preached and said, You can eat some more? I said, Yeah, I can eat a little more. So we went to a buffet and got some more food. Why do we do that? Because we're hungry, because we wanted some food. Oh, that we were that hungry for the Word of God. Oh, that we were hungry for the Word of God. The men's Bible study, we were reading, we were in the men's Bible study, and one of the, the main teacher, I forget his name, I think it's Pastor Roberts, said that oftentimes, instead of meditating on the Word of God, we medicate ourselves. When you got a problem in your life and problems come up every day, you get wounded. Someone says something about you. So some, 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 somebody does something to you. What do you tend to do? You tend to medicate yourself. 70% of all men look at pornography. That's, that's, that's the medication. Or we overeat. Or we overspend. Or we do something to medicate ourselves. But instead of medicating ourselves, we need to meditate on the word. Meditate on the word. And that's the, the question is this week. Are we going to meditate on the word or are we going to medicate ourselves by just doing something that soothes the pain instead of doing what God wants us to do, which is study his blessed book. Dear friends, the greatest thing you can do this week is spend time in this book. Sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. Time with God is time well spent. You want to grow in your Christian life? It all begins with what you do with the Word of God. Half of your fears, half of our fears come because we do not spend time in the Bible. Dear friend, I encourage you, I beg you, I plead with you, Again, spend time in this book. Meditate in this book. There's a, there's a Bible program that I started using last week called BibleMemory.org, I believe it is. You go to the website, it will send you verses on, on, on an email, on your phone, on your iWatch. It will send you verses to memorize and meditate on. We need to get the Word of God in our minds. We get the Word of God in our lives because we are a people that struggle every day with some type of issue. And as I counsel people on a regular basis, they are, me they are either medicating because of in on sin or they're meditating on the Word of God. The question is, which one are you doing? Father, I pray, God, tonight that you bless. We thank you for your book. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. And I pray, God, Lord, as we've seen the importance of, what does it mean to be a Baptist? The importance of biblical authority. Once again, we've been, we've been challenged, Lord, to spend time with your word. Oh, God, we spend time in so many different areas. So important areas, important areas. But I wonder tonight, when's the last time we memorized a verse of scripture? When's the last time we spent more than two or three minutes meditating on your word at all this week? When's the, when's the last time we picked up that book and read it faithfully? Every day for a week. Pastor, I don't memorize the Bible. Pastor, I don't meditate on the Bible. Pastor, to be honest with you, I'm not reading the Bible, but I know I should. Maybe it's simply the problems you're having in your life right now because you're trying to medicate. You're trying to medicate, but you're simply not meditating on this blessed book. Pastor, would you pray for me? I need to spend more time in it. I need to, I need to hunger for it. I need to thirst for it. I need to love it. 
I need to know it. Would you pray for me that God would help me to do so tonight? Anybody at all today? Be challenged? Amen. Anybody else? I'm struggling. I don't, I don't think about it. I don't meditate on it. Don't memorize it. Don't dwell in it. And you wonder why you struggle in the areas you struggle? Maybe it's simply it's just time to change. Maybe it's just simply time to change. Pastor, I'm struggling in this area. Would you help me? Would you pray for me? Anybody at all this evening? Anybody else at all? Father, help us tonight to get a good grip of the importance of the Word of God. Let's stand to our feet. God has spoken to your heart. You'd like to make a decision. The altar is open. We can help you in any way, be an encouragement to you in your way, and help you in any way.